What's up, guys? This is MW Perry 2009, aka Sexy Dream Pirate. Uh, I'm here with the Chaos. How's it going, guys? We are getting ready to finish up our Evo Fury review. We're down to our last sieve in the color wheel, Nature. Um, it is Christmas Eve right now, so whenever this video goes up, it'll be Christmas. Happy holidays, y'all! Good to everybody. Uh, I hope you get some new cards, maybe. But uh, anyways, before we get started with our nature review, I would uh, like to take a chance to, uh, I guess, apologize about some of the things we said about forklift tank blue urgle and uh, you know maybe retract our statement on this in the sense that uh, we misread the card we had an error in translation I guess you could say and it turns out whenever you mill with this card if you mill a creature you can bounce a creature from the field we were we read it as uh, if you mill a creature that creature goes to your opponent's hand so it turns out forklift tank glue is a much better card than what I thought uh, a lot better uh, deck mill than what Slive is, so I hope you guys enjoyed my moment of stupidity on YouTube. I'll try to limit it down to maybe one or so a month. So uh, anyways, <sighs> on to nature, our last segment, and I hope you guys enjoy. Starting with our one cost creatures, Prickleback, one for 2,000, Beastkin, um, has hit and run at the end of each of your turns. If he breaks a shield, he jumps back in your hand, similar to Heal of Flame. Um, if you guys haven't watched our previous videos, we grade on a 1 to 5 star scale, basically 1 being piss poor useless, and 5 being uber mega awesome. So, I run Prickleback. I'm going to have to say that Prickleback yeah. is definitely a 4 star card. With him being uh, the cheapest beastkin out there, he's amazing Evo bait. He's one for two, so he's above average for attacking power. Normally, it's two for two, uh, even in the nature sieve. And uh, the whole breaking shields thing and then jumping back in your hand, it actually works out really well because it's easier to protect your beastkin bait for when you need it. So I'm a big fan of Prickleback. I'm gonna say four stars without a doubt. All right, and uh, as for me, I, I do like him. He works, and he's batting one for two. So even if you don't want him to hit a shield and uh, just bout and use him for knocking out something, then all you've wasted is a tap one creature. So that's always a very effective mix. Plus, he is a beastkin, so he works very well into an Evo rush strategy or anything with an Evo. Yeah, that is utilizing a beastkin. Um, I can honestly say that if you took Prickle back and turned him into flame spike tats. That that'd be a very awesome trade off. Mm. And uh, for me, I think it's an easy four stars for Prickle back just because he's so practical. Yeah. Most definitely get a lot of work out of Prickle back. Moving on to our next two, or our first two drop creature, two for two thousand. Moonhaller tribe, another beast kin was uh, burning main in the old DM game. And I can honestly say I'm glad they brought it back. Uh, getting another solid four-star rating from me. It's two for two, so you know it's average. It's average run-of-the-mill power-wise, but it is an Eve or it is excellent beastkin bait. Uh, it can trade with some stuff. It can get rid of the one-drop blockers. It, it's just got a lot of practical uses all the way around the board and. What gives it that four star rather than three star rating is the fact that it is a beast can. So it, it's really good for Evo and it's really good for uh, early game field presence and pressure as well. So Moon Hallow Tribe, four stars for me. <clears throat> no, well, pretty much this would be the same thing as Prickleback. Um, I mean, he's a very practical card for any sort of Earth deck. Just just because being a beast can is what gives him the best part. Um, like I said, right now, he's a four, simply because the only Evos they currently have in nature are Beastkin. So if you're wanting to run any sort of evolution creature at all, you're going to have to rely on Beastkin to do that. And that makes Moonhowler one of the many necessities. Um, 
I mean, a person could trade in a Moon Howler for a Fear Fang if there wasn't a little bit more, you know, punch. But, uh, I mean, they're still going to spend one more mana. And in a rush deck, spending as little mana for as much firepower as possible is key. Uh, so, you know, once again, for, for me, Moon Howler is going to have to be a four-star creature as well. All right, moving on to three costs. Snapclaw. Three for 2,000. Now, this one has a definite, very Evo-themed um, effect. Each of your evolution creatures get 2,000 power. So, basically, we just got a souped-up Essence Elf for Evos only. Um, the effect is really nice, but even in my deck, I run two Snapclaw, I run three Laser Arm, and I run three Bronze Arm Sabertooth in my Nature Fire Rush. And with two Snapclaw, I still only get, you know, maybe, maybe two, at most two, but normally only one of my evolution creatures manages to get the 2,000 power bump. Whenever you can work him into a strategy well, he's nice. Um, if you if you run like a Nature Fire Water aggro or something similar to that, uh, he'd probably see a little bit more use just because he's be he would be easier to protect. But the 2,000 power just makes him really hard to protect. He gets hit with all the cheap removal. He gets hit with heat seekers. I mean, there's he's not safe from anything, really. And with his power being so low, if you run him in a rush deck, you either have to choose between not attacking, which isn't good, to keep him safe and keep your evos with their bump, or you can choose to swing with him knowing that he's pretty much going to be dead on your opponent's turn. So, I mean, th there's a lot of positives to this card, and there's a not lot of negatives for Snapclaw. Overall, I'm just going to have to say three stars. He's nice, the power bump is great, but you only get so much use out of it. You get a lot more if you were to run Raging Gallant or, uh, you know, Essence Elf. Mm. Well, for me, uh, I'm going to have to go with a three-star rating for Snapclaw, uh, simply because a deck can do with it a de or a deck can do without it. Uh, I mean, there's not really a whole lot to say about him. I mean, it's cool that he gives a bump to Evos, but... Uh, I don't know. I mean, I preferably I I I'd rather just run S and self. Yeah. Just cause. So yeah, uh, snap follows are going to be a three star rating for me as well. All right, moving on to four drops. Illusionary Berry four for three thousand. It has power attacker two thousand. It's a tree kin, and that's basically all there is to say about it. It's pretty much a very average run of the mill card. Um. I don't see us getting any Treekin evolutions anytime soon, so, you know, he's not going to be bait for anything. And for 4 drop, 3,000 power attack or 2,000, we already have Karate Carrot that goes to mana whenever it's destroyed. So, you know, for it, for the Evo Fury release, you know, is is pretty average card, but since we already have something that's better, it's exactly the same with... I, you know, a little bit more plus to it, I'm going to have to say Illusionary Berry is only going to get two stars from me. Yeah, that's pretty much what's what, I, what I'm going to say as well. He was replaced even before he's created, so there's really not much of a point to have him in, in your deck, really. Um, yeah, two stars. Just nothing really special about him. I mean... I don't know. I don't. I don't really see any reason why anybody right now would be running him, especially since we have Karate Carrot, which the art for Karate Carrot is cooler anyway. I like his Fu Manchu mustache. But uh, anyways, next four drop, Bronze Arm Sabretooth, four for seven thousand. Beastkin Evolution, Double Breaker, and whenever he's banished, you uh, put him into your mana zone. Now keep in mind, every card underneath him goes in your mana zone as well, so you're putting at least two, I don't know why you'd ever be putting three in, but you're putting at least two cards in your mana zone uh, whenever he gets destroyed, which uh, he does get hit with the cheap removal, but with the mana bump that he gives you, it's not necessarily a you know huge blow if he does die. 
Um, power is looking great. Four for 7,000, so he's almost doubling his power to cost. Uh, he's a beastkin, so he's got tons and tons of bait out there. He's double breaker. He's just, you know, good, solid, all the way around, mega awesome card. Uh, he fits in in aggro decks. He fits in in rush decks. Just, this card puts in a crazy good amount of work. Shenanigans everywhere. Um, I'm going to have to say Bronze Arm Saber Tooth is getting five stars from me all the way. I run three of them, and I love them. Um, I'll agree with them on there. Uh, the five stars... Uh, I think the the fifth star is coming from the fact that if he does get banished, there goes our music. Um, oh, no. The fifth star is definitely coming from the fact that if he does get banished, that him and his uh, Evo material is getting dropped in the mana zone. And a two bomb is truly something spectacular. Um, that's honestly one of the things I really like about the Nature Sith is the there's just so many opportunities for mana bump. Um, I recently just tested out a Nature Light dual sieve. Long story short, the project was scrapped. Um, if I face him and I lose three times in a row, I'll scrap whatever deck I'm making just because it means that it's just not working out for me. But, uh, what was it? By turn five, I was already at seven mana. Oh, I, I saw more than that. Uh, there was one game by turn five, I think he was up to eight or nine. He had dropped a sprout on me. A bronze arm saber tooth had been destroyed, and he'd used a reap and sap. So, I mean, the mana ramp on the mana ramp with bronze arm saber tooth is absolutely crazy. He's wonderful in rush decks simply because rush decks, especially if I'm running it, it normally goes to about four mana, and that's all I have enough cards for. But if somebody bone blades a bronze arm saber tooth, I'm up to six. So whenever they start cracking away at my shields, I can just swarm. So, uh, for that, I mean, Bronze Arm Saber Tooth, five stars. Definitely. Out. Definite. Mm -hmm. I'll let you take the other half. Okay. Uh, we got a couple more monsters here, including a super rare and about two spells. All right. This uh, next monster we'll have is um, the first of the, tap, of the two tap fives. Um, he is a Silver Fist. He's a Beast Can, and he is the Nature Civilization's mono card. Basically, uh, mono card is meaning that if you're building a mono collar deck, that this is what you're wanting if you're going for green. Um, base starting, he's fire for four. So right there, even not a mono card, he's still decent. I mean, there are a lot, there are darkness cards out there that are worse than this. Uh, obviously, if there's you know worse darkness and there's worse water, but what he get, what he gets if you um, if all the mana in your mana zone are nature, um, then he gets. Double breaker, and he gets an additional 4,000 power. That's base power, not power attack, which means he's batting for 8,000 out of tap five. All right, that's better than Brave Giant. I actually think that's right up there with uh, what's the guy's face, Granite Avenger? Yeah, yeah. two mana less, and he's at 8,000. So, I'll, as you can tell, that's obviously a very big advantage if you're running a mono green. I've been fancying the idea, but I really like blockers because. Without him, it's just too easy to tell if I'm going to lose or not, and, you know, that's a bit of a morale drop. But, to the point, uh, Silver Fist, for me, is getting a five-star rating, as long as you're running a monochrome deck, uh, because if he's not, then he's just a standard three-star. But uh, that's the rating I'm giving him. So, I'll just say five stars for monochrome, because that's really the only thing you want to do with any sort of monocolor card, because um, if you read it and you can't get the effect, then it's kind of disheartening, but... Uh, yeah, in a mono sieve, I mean, I know that's the point of mono themed cards, but in a mono sieve, I'm gonna have to give Silver Fist five stars as well. Uh, he pointed out definitely five for eight thousand. He's right up there with Granite Avenger. He's got Double Breaker on him. Um, another thing, he's too expensive of uh, bait to use for. Bronze Arm Sabertooth, but in a pinch, he is a 5-drop, so you can't evolve him on turn 6 into Flame Spike Um, that, I don't, it, it would be one of those things that if in a pinch you just had to do, if they've got a blocker on the field that's bigger than 8,000, uh, it's definitely Grand Gear, so. Yeah. But, um, you know, I'm just gonna have to say 5 stars as well, uh. Wizards did a really good job coming out with our mono-themed cards. Um, another thing I would like to point out, he did point out that if you if you dual sieve or multi sieve, 
He's five for four thousand, so I don't know why you would do it, but if you did, I mean, there's light and darkness cards, uh, Droxar, uh, some other ones. I just can't quite think of them right now, but there are other cards that you know are the same, so or in in darkness and water, so you could do worse. Uh, this card may, it, I mean, it's not going to see as much play in. Uh, multi sieve. I don't think it'll see any play multi sieve, but in a single mono sieve deck, you know, mono green, this card is crazy good. Five stars. Okay, uh, next up for the five drops in nature, we have four set the heroic shaman. Uh, he is five for seven and a double breaker. The only catch on this guy is that he can only attack shields. Um, he's basically a, an un skirmisher. Yeah. But uh, anti skirmish or whatever, I guess. But um, he's five for seven, so right there, the addition to power is nice. Uh, however, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's good to an extent, but I think you can do without him. So for that, I'm gonna have to give him three stars, and that's pretty basically the end of my little shindig. Um. I'll say that I love the card art for this card. It's the alternate art for Torcon in the old DM game. But, um, 5 for 7, so the power is good. The fact that he can't attack uh, creatures basically means that the only time he takes out a creature is if they throw a blocker in his way. So um, the power doesn't really matter. Yeah, the power on him doesn't really matter. 9 times out of 10, he's going to be getting chump blocked or attacked. Um... The double breaker puts on a lot of good or like semi or like mid game pressure because he's swinging on turn six unless you get your mana ramp on. Uh, he's not really acceptable Evo bait for anything. Um, I mean, I suppose you could use him to evolve into a flame spike, but I, I wouldn't recommend it. I'm gonna have to say three stars as well. I mean, uh, the whole can't attack creatures pretty much makes his power useless. Uh, it is good that he's not affected by cheap removal. I will say that you know it keeps him it keeps him away from that. So they either have to spend something expensive, or they have to throw a big creature at it to get rid of that you know dangerous double breaker effect. So I mean, I, it has its place. I suppose we'll be seeing you know force it heroic shaman uh, you know in later. Like getting some play with later sets, uh, he's probably getting some play now, just not from either one of us. I'm gonna give him three stars as well. He has his uses, but his use is mainly like an intimidation factor, I guess you could say, just yeah. to keep your opponent worrying about him since he's an early double breaker. Right. All right. Uh, the next up is uh, the last Evo that they released with this set. Um, it is Flame Spike Tatsorian. He's a tap six for eight thousand with a base. Uh, he's an evolved beastkin. So once again, like I said before, previously with Prickleback, uh, he's a, he's six for eight. A funny thing here is that anytime he's doing battle, whether he is attacking or being attacked, he is at fourteen thousand. Yeah, he gets an extra 6,000 power when battling. When not, battling. Not power attack. Like, yeah. power all the time. We just didn't want to print something with 14,000 in the lower left corner to scare y'all. Yeah. I, I don't know. So, I I don't understand why they did it that way. Um, I mean, there's not really any reason why they shouldn't have. He's at 8,000, so he's not affected by any sort of removal other than death, smoke, and... Terrapit or anything with a body of the corresponding two. So it's really neither here nor there whether they put it on there. I mean, maybe I'm thinking maybe they did it for some sort of purpose because he's six for eight. Otherwise, he would have been six for 14, and Evo Fury Tats is what is he, eight or nine for 12? He's, he's seven, I believe seven. Don't quote me on it. He's not in front of me right now, but I believe he's. Seven for twelve with uh, triple breaker and an interesting okay so effect. okay never mind that was my idea shot to shit there's really no reason why they didn't um, 
Well, I'm sure there was something on a corporate level, technicality, something that made them have to print it this way. If I had to pick any reason why they may have given it 8,000 and then an extra 6,000 when battling, whether, you know, blah, 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 whether attacked or attacking, I'm going to say uh, maybe in some future sets we could see some sort of fire destruction card that allows you to destroy any number of creatures up to 8,000 power total. Maybe. You know, similar to Blast Forge Captain, only... You know, only I guess it, I mean, that's it, the only reason they could would have put it that way yeah. is power or yeah power based removal rather than level based. I suppose. I mean, so. that's the only reason. So may, and maybe Dragon Strike's gonna have a big fire destruction card that'll be mega awesome. We'll see. But uh, for Flame Spike, I think it's an easy five stars. If not for the fact he's probably the heaviest hitter in all of Kaijudo right now. Biggest beat stick. Uh, then, just for the simple fact that he's awesome. Uh, pretty much, yeah, five stars, just because it's nice. I wish we had more than one. I'm going to have, you know, I think it would be really interesting <sighs> if... Uh, Stop it. They, they should have made an achievement on the Evo... Uh, on the Evo Fury League card that was get Flame Spike Tetsurian up to 20,000 power using, like, Raging Goliath and Snapclaw. I don't know. I just think that'd be kind of funny. I suppose. I mean... I mean, it, it is crazy how big that you can get this guy because bump cards are geared towards Beast Kin, all sorts of stuff. I mean, granted, he gets hit with a Slayer and Terror Pit, he's gone. But right now, he is the... Uh, well, even still, you give him a 9,000 bump at max. Oh, yeah. I mean, either... Either way, Flame Spike Tetsurian is the biggest beat stick that we've seen out of Kaijudo right now. He's got a shit ton more Evo bait out there for him than what uh, Evo Fury Tetsurian does. So that is amazing. He's double breaker. There's no drawback to running this card. Uh, the six cost keeps him protected from cheap removal. It's just, uh, it's a solid, amazing card. So I'm going to have to give it five stars as well. All right, and uh, next up we have a Tap 7, and he is called the Granite Avenger. Uh, he's 7 for 8,000 Double Breaker. Pretty much he's an upgraded version of Brave Giant. Uh, both Brave Giant and Granite are both um, Colossus. Um, when I'm talking about Colossus in plural, I say Colossi. You know, like, instead of cactuses, you say cacti. So, um, I'll be throwing that term here. Um, just for this, the fact that he's an upgraded version pretty much X's out Brave Giant as any build in any card in any deck whatsoever. Um, until they, until they come out with a, uh, release for Evos based on, Col on Colossi, that's, that's when you'll see, I'm sure, Granite Avenger be played a lot more, um... Even whenever I just tested out that deck I just had, I originally had two of them in there, but then axed them out just as quickly because Grand Knight's a decent finisher. He doesn't cost a whole lot of mana, but he costs a decent bit. Uh, I'm giving him three stars because you can build a solid deck without him or you can build one with him. I mean, you're not gaining anything, but you're not losing anything by not having him in your deck either. So, three stars. I'm going to have to go along with the Chaos as well, with Granite Avenger being a three-star card. And the main reason why, granted, yes, he has big power, yes, he has double breaker, but he also has a really high cost, seven for eight. So, I mean, that's, that's I guess, run-of-the-mill, kind of average for nature. It is better than Brave Giant, so if you are running Brave Giant, you can slip in Granite Avenger and, you know, you just did, you improved your deck slightly. But... Yeah, for he. I mean, it's just an average beat stick. There's not really anything amazing about it. Yes, it's protected from cheap removal, but with it being maybe if it was a six drop, it'd see some more play. But right now, it's just it's too expensive, really. For it's too expensive for too little gain. There's other seven cost creatures that are much better put on the field, or even combinations of creatures. Uh, you know, I I mean. You'd run a gas bag and a keeper of clouds, and I think you'd be doing better than dropping in a single granite adventure. So, I don't know. He's just he's an average run of the mill beat stick that gets taken down by skull cutter. So three stars. I really like gas bags. He's 
<laughs> you pretty much lose nothing by swinging with them. Yeah. Uh, the next stop is, is a relatively famous card. Uh, relatively. Um, a lot of people are using it. There's actually a deck built solidly around him. Personally, I hate building a deck around one card. Just because, I mean... Because then you're forced to include water. Yeah, well, that and it's like... You're a one-trick pony. Mm. I said it. But, um... This guy is the Tap 8 8000, Lepidos the Ancient. I don't know why every time I go up I just do this and knock out Pirate. I don't know. You just don't like my sexy dream Pirate face. I don't... Maybe. I don't know. Either that, I think it's just more comfortable. This is my natural thing. But, um, he's a double breaker and he's got a little something-something that whenever he attacks you automatically... Take one of your opponent's shield and Ooh. shields and put right, it. In read the, the effect. It's not whenever he attacks. Oh, it's wins a battle. Yeah, okay. w whenever any of your creatures wins a battle. Oh, okay. When one of your creatures wins a battle, choose one of your opponent's shields and put and they put that shield into his or her mana zone. Um, technically, it's not breaking the shield. So, shield blasts are ineffective at that point, which makes it really shitty if you end up man if you end up fucking uh, throwing a terror pit in a mana zone. I mean, it makes it happy for you, but pissy for them. But um, Lepidos is a really good card just for that sake. And like I said, there's a lot of people building decks around him, and that's it. Uh, so for the sake of the matter, it's a really awesome effect, and it's a double breaker. So five stars for me, just because he's very versatile, and his effect is pretty beast. Uh, I'm going to give five stars for Lepidos the Ancient as well. Eight for eight thousand, so it's got average power. It's got double breaker, uh, and then the effect on this card is absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, I think it was Bald Medius, that might be his name that was in Old DM that sh sent Shield straight to the graveyard. Uh, yeah, this is almost as good. You're denying your opponent the point of Shields, which is you know, if you're if Whenever a shield's broken, it goes to your hand, it gives them another option to fight back. So by running this card, you get rid of the draw off the shield, you negate shield blasts, shield blasts, and then on top of that, it's not just him that's causing this effect, it's any of your creatures. So if you run Lepidos the Ancient, spend all the way up to turn 8 stacking big light skirmish blockers, and then turn 8 Lepidos, it, turn 9... You drop the Storm Spark Blast and just take out everything, send all of those shields into the mana zone. Which, I mean, yeah, bumping their mana sucks, but at the same time, getting rid of the, keeping shields, keeping shield blasts, you know, not happening and keeping their hand low because you're not feeding it shields is just absolutely amazing. Uh, I'm gonna give this card five stars as well. Any card, that can, you know, create its own meta is amazing. I mean, you've got you've got Rush, Control, Aggro, and then you've got Lepidos Orion, you know, which, I mean, you can argue that that is Control, but, yes, it, it is a branch of Control, but it's Lepidos Orion Control, you know? It's pretty much its own meta. So, I mean, any, this is a game-changing card, five stars for me. Yeah. Uh, basically, this is the difference between NFL and Madden NFL 2000-something. Yeah. All right, uh, the next up, uh, we're out of monsters, so we're bringing it into uh, spells now. Uh, we have a tap four, Reap and Sow, non-shield blast, but that's fine. Although, if they made one that was a shield blast, that would be really cool. Oh, if it was a shield blast, that card would be broken. Oh, not necessarily. It'd be Spy Mission with mana drop. I think it'd be broke. I mean, it's it's seeing a shit ton of play now. Well, um, I've ran Reap and Sow in my uh, life and uh, nature. Um, I will say this, though. Uh, there have been times where I had to charge this directly into mana. It was either this or one of my blockers, and I needed the blockers pretty much all the time. So it hurts you a pretty good bit whenever you actually have to charge this card. Uh, maybe not in gameplay, but, like, it hurts you inside. <laughs> Um, it breaks my soul. It, it, it it's not too nice, but um, anytime I run a nature deck, I run heavy on mana ramp because that's pretty much my purpose for having them in there for anything. But uh, reap and sow is damn good. I um, I think it's better than spy mission and logos put together. Um, for me, reap and sow gets five stars just because it is just truly awesome, and it's good, and it's a pretty much necessary deck staple in any sort of. Mana ramp. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I'm going to have to give Reap and Sow five stars as well. This is another game-changing card that we got out of the Nature Sith with Evo Fury. Basically, whenever you use it, you pull top two cards from your deck. One goes into mana, one goes in your hand. So basically, Nature got some really effective mana ramp along with some good draw power. Um, so, I mean, it, it's a really good card. It fits into almost any strategy. It it's good in control, it's good in aggro. I haven't seen anybody playing it in rush, mainly because it's it's a little expensive for a rush spell and normally you just want to focus on removal, but I suppose it could fit in in a rush strategy just because sometimes, well, for me, a lot of times whenever I stop putting on the pressure is because I'm, I'm wiped out, I don't have any cards in my hand. So, I mean, uh, I mean, Reap and Sow just fits in in just about any deck that you're running nature. And it's, it's got some draw, it's got some mana bump, it's just a good, solid card all the way around. Uh, five stars for me. I, I really, I like Reap and Sow, I love Reap and Sow, I think it's great. Okay, and the final card that we have for nature is a Shield Blast. It's called Tendril Grasp, it's a tap six. Uh, basically what it does, it's kind of like Barrage, only not based on attack. Um, you put all creatures at a level 3 or less from the field into their mana zones. That goes for both you and your opponent. So if you're running a rush deck, this is a, a big no-no. Unless you really just want to fuck shit up and you're just playing just to see how crazy shit can get. Um... However, if you're running this card in like a heavy aggro, and I'm talking like nothing below level 4 or something like that, then I could see it playing to your effect. Uh, pretty much this is doomsday for any sort of rush deck. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's... And w with all that stuff being said, it is a very situational card. This could easily turn the tables around three times over. Uh, uh, for me, I'm going to say three stars, uh, just simply because it's a very situational card, and it's pretty much, ri it's, it's really risky, I would think. So, uh, three stars for me, and yeah, that's all i got to say about it so far. I'm going to give Tindergrass three stars as well. As the Chaos pointed out, if, uh, you know, if a Rush deck gets hit with this card... It's it's a lot of trouble for rush decks to get over. So in that sense, it is good, you know, rush deck defense to run it, especially in an aggro heavy deck. Um, I mean, it's it's really good removal, honestly, for nature. Uh, you know, all nature removal sends it to the mana zone anyway. But this is one of those cards that could really end up hurting you uh, if you if. First of all, I don't see this getting played from the hand a whole lot. It's a little bit expensive for that. And, you know, it's it's if you play this from the hand, then normally you've been sitting on it for a while. I don't see very many people playing it from the hand. Therefore, most of it's going to come from shields. Now, if you play this from shields, uh, it, could be, it could be very... Very much a double-edged sword. I mean, this could cause you to win the game, and it could very well cause you to lose it. Uh, against a rush deck, Tindergrass would be very good. Uh, I would not recommend using this card against any deck that has draw ability whatsoever. Even, I mean, if you can clear the field of their blockers and little stuff, and you've got something big that'll stay out, then maybe. Because you are bumping your own stuff as well. But, I mean, th this is one of those cards that, I mean, you're going to have to be really strategic and very careful with playing. It can, like I said, it can cause you to win, it can cause you to lose. And if you if you try playing it against a deck that's got some draw ability, you just mana ramp them big time. And, you know, especially if it's water, then they can start getting several creatures and several spells out on one turn. So it's just, it's one of those things that it... It's cool, but you got to be careful with it. It can really get you in trouble. Um, for that, all of that, I'm going to have to say Tendril Grasp is three stars. I've seen it work for people, and I've seen people really screw themselves over with it. Anyways, that is the end of 
our little Evo Rush review, or sorry, Evo Fury review. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed all of it. Kudos if you watched all of it. Um, you know, happy holidays. I hope you guys enjoyed yourself. I hope you liked our content, our little shenanigans while everybody's on break. Uh, maybe, maybe when you're at a family dinner and bored, you've got something to watch on your cell phone. No, I don't know. But uh, until next time, you guys keep playing. You got anything you want to say to YouTube? Mm, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy whatever the Nigerian holiday is, Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa. Isn't that Nigerian? I guess. Happy bunch of stuff, but I'm not saying happy holidays because I'm American. Peace out, guys. Keep playing.